Hello, everybody. Jason here from the At The Coalface podcast. I've created a new sub-series called Mentoring Moments, and Mentoring Moments is composed of clips taken from my one-on-one and group mentorship sessions where we discuss e-commerce, digital, retail, and so much more. Hopefully, you get a lot out of this. Enjoy. Thanks very much, guys. Hopefully, we can cover a lot of territory today. That will be certainly my goal is to cover as much ground as we can and cover as many questions as we can, but make sure that we give each question as much time and focus and love as we can. The other thing is I'm not a digital marketer and a lot of people think that I am, but I don't specifically work in the marketing, digital marketing space. I usually can give hopefully some very useful answers to digital marketers with any specific questions they have, but it's worth pointing out that I am not a digital marketer. That's not what I do. I'm more of a of an operational digital commerce specialist, technical and operational digital commerce specialist. That's really where my specialization and my career has been spent at the pointy end of the spear of commerce tech, commerce implementations, organizational design, process design, data design and engineering, and solution design. So that's really where my specialism is. But obviously, I've built my own personal brand online as well. And look, I live at the pointy end of business, marketing, and technology. Obviously, a lot of marketing today is technology-driven with CDPs and marketing automation platforms and all the rest, first-party data, zero-party data platforms and the like. Look, I have a deep operational understanding of marketing, so hopefully I can be helpful to you guys there. And I hopefully have some help that I can give specifically around the areas of career progression, personal brand building, those types of things. I've helped a lot of people. I've mentored on a one-to-one basis in agencies that I've run. I've helped mentor people through their career progression. So hopefully I'm able to provide some advice and guidance there where it's necessary. And hopefully everybody will get a chance to ask any questions that are on their mind today. So that's pretty much the housekeeping out of the way. So I'm going to open up the floor. Anybody that wants to stick up their hand first, I know, John, you got a chance to speak to me a couple of weeks ago, so you may not have many questions for me today, but I'm ready to hand the floor over to the audience here and anybody that would like to put up their hand and ask the first question, let's we can kick things off. I have one, Jason, on we're using Shopify from a D2C perspective, and it's really around that loyalty piece, that nurturing your customers should this recession be as bad as what we're talking about how do we really nurture those customers that we already have at what point does it actually make sense for a small business what point does it actually make sense to pay more per month on those plans is it worth going all out or any thoughts or recommendations there the funny thing with shopify is that you really don't gain anything from a loyalty perspective by going up plans, even up to Shopify plus, you really don't, it's not like you gain a whole bunch of the, that would make a customer by definition stickier, just because you're using a a more expensive Mm. plan of Shopify, where you start to benefit with Shopify plus is things like API connectivity, API overheads and bandwidths, Shopify flow, you start to get, you start to be able to customize checkout a little bit more, at least from a design and look and feel perspective, but you really don't get a tremendous amount amount of additional functionality. And so even from a promotions perspective, you can only have one automatic promotion active at a time on any, regardless of the plan, you can have Shopify scripts, which can run custom, you can have custom promotions with Shopify scripts and stuff on plus, but most merchants don't do that. Even when they're on Shopify plus, they usually go on to plus because they're at such a GMV value that effectively Shopify pushes them onto plus anyway, or they want to start using Shopify pause and they want to have it included with their plan and some of the upgrades on Shopify pause. They want to have this holistic system that can handle massive volume. So that's the major benefit of going with plus. Now, when it comes to loyalty programs or membership programs, those are all delivered via apps anyway, regardless of what. Yeah. Which yeah. Are. So we're with your whole Oh, sorry, Yopo is the reviews loyalty is S loyalty, I think it is. Yes, a lot of brands will use like Rise or Yopo or any one of a number of other loyalty yeah. programs, platforms. Now, the one downside that I often see when I'm going in and I'm doing maybe some digital strategy work with brands and things like that is, is I, I, I oftentimes when we start to pull back the bonnet on the quote unquote loyalty program that they have, 
nine times out of 10, it's a spend, earn, spend loyalty program. So basically you spend a certain amount of money, you get a certain amount of points, which translates to a certain amount of dollars, and then you redeem that effectively on your next purchase. Now, in many cases, this is simply turns out to be giving margin away for free because if everybody's running the virtually the same loyalty program with virtually the same tiers, with virtually the same value, and the value add really only is spend, earn, spend, that, as we know, doesn't in and of itself generally create much loyalty. And we know from global data that even for brands that are running a quote unquote loyalty program, anywhere from 80 to 90% of their customers will never buy from that website more than once. So even getting a customer to buy off of you a second time is exceptionally difficult. And so most brands would actually do better and be better off if they canned their loyalty program, they lowered their overall prices or they gave away free shipping all the time as opposed to having a free shipping threshold. Or we know that shipping costs are one of the biggest levers you can pull in e-commerce today from a conversion perspective and a retention perspective. So most brands in the absence of a truly differentiated loyalty program, and I believe that most brands struggle to implement a differentiated loyalty program. I think that the general market is going more in the direction of membership programs versus loyalty. I think that Amazon is the exemplar here, right? We look at Prime, you have to join up with Prime, but they are continually adding more and more value to Prime. They keep raising the price of Prime, yes, but the value is absolutely obvious. For anybody that's used Prime before, they know how much value it brings. And it's it brings so much value that it makes Prime seem almost cheap, almost too cheap for what you get for your Prime dollar. And so I think that many brands are starting to get wise to that. And they're saying, we can create stickier customers that will be more loyal by definition by making them a member and making them pay for a membership tier than just giving away loyalty for free that in a non-differentiated way. Because it's very difficult to add enough value through a traditional loyalty program to, to make it tangible enough that people go, I would only go here because the loyalty program is just so amazing. Mecca and a few others, they've got some pretty amazing loyalty programs. But the reality is that most retailers, especially non-D2C retailers, so B2C retailers that are selling the same product as other brands, so they don't, they're not a manufacturing brand yeah. and they're not a distrib- yeah. distributing brand, very difficult for them to differentiate when it's mostly a race to the bottom from a price perspective anyway. So they've already got margin pressure. Yeah, so then taking that off into referral schemes and that word of mouth piece in there that might be missing. Yeah, look, again, it's very similar to loyalty. I don't know anyone. It's I've worked for some of the biggest brands in ANZ and with some of the biggest brands in ANZ and referrals never, ever are a significant part of their business. It's just okay. not. Almost no matter what incentive they give, if I love shopping with a brand and I'm going to recommend them anyway. Well, I'll recommend them anyway. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to the website and get my loyalty code or get the custom URL and paste that out of my account and then send it to my friend via email or Facebook messenger. I'm just not going to go through those steps as a rule unless I get, so there was, there's a brand in the States called iHerb. They've gone away from their original model, but they originally built their entire business on the referral model and the way that they did. And I was one of their very earliest customers and I loved their referral model because if you referred someone, you got a percentage off of that person's buying forever, just a one off. And yeah, it was a forever referral program as opposed to, oh, you get a one, you get 10% off their first purchase or you get 25 bucks or whatever. There was a massive incentive to refer them because you got a percentage of everything they bought forever. And so that was a pretty good referral program and people went out of their way to refer and they actually, they, they built their business actually on influencers that because that referral program was so successful, they didn't even do outreach with influencers. Influencers just did it on their own. So they would do like a purchase, they would do a haul on YouTube where they would do an unboxing and then they would put their referral code in the description or up on the screen. And then they knew that their audience, if their audience purchased, then they were going to get a share of that audience's purchases forever. And so they've done away with that now. They've played with their loyalty and referrals program over the years. And they've made five or six tweaks to it. And that's not no longer how it works. Apart from truly standout referral programs like that, most mid-market brands, they can't create a referral program that gets any traction. Anything else? I spoke to you first way back two years ago, I think it was Econ Live in Belfast, where you dialed in. Our biggest issue, we have two brands. One does particularly well online, which is a skincare brand. Our biggest challenge is that we also have the traditional trade salons 
that we still supply into because they're professionals and that's where our, our brand was born. And there's just this constant clash <laughs> of your discounting online. You said it was a professional brand, blah, 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 blah. And I don't know that we ever, I don't know that, that we ever solve that other than we tend to try and now run the same promotions and the same discount strategy online as we do offline but that then limits what we potentially do online and I'm just wondering is there any thoughts or is there anybody else that you've come across that's, that has been able to do it particularly well because anybody I do talk to it's always going to be a clash it's all it's always that independent retailer versus moving forward with e-commerce or even trying to get them to do social selling online it's just extremely hard work but at the same time from a volume perspective I can't do without them right now so yeah is there anybody in particular that has managed to do that particularly yeah probably the brand that's in your sort of vertical or category that's managed to do this really well is dermalogica they have been very yeah. successful at creating a dc brand but also supporting independent skincare professionals that sell and deliver the dermalogica products alongside perhaps other products in a full-blown skincare setting so i think they're probably the gold standard in that now the yeah. biggest challenge that they have is that when you look at some of the marketplaces where some of the skincare brands or some of the skincare specialists have bought their products in bulk and then resell through marketplaces. They've had their own challenges in terms of brand damage, especially when they've tried to also go direct to marketplaces and they've tried to preserve their margin in marketplaces to protect their brand. But then they have some of their resellers that undercut them in the marketplaces. It's a very challenging space when you are running DTC in combination with B2B. It is just challenging. It, there's no two ways yeah, about this. Yeah, I've yeah. worked with a few brands now I worked with a very large brand in Australia working in the, let's just say the watch category. I won't go any more specific than that. And they, for the, for many years, for many decades in Australia, they were B2B only. Then they went to establish a D2C brand. Now they didn't discuss this with their B2B customers because they didn't actually want to deal with the pushback. They knew that there was going to be pushback, but they, the challenge that they had was that there were two areas where they their retailers and resellers were not able to drive significant revenue and they had major issues with the B2B customers cherry picking the range. So for example, there was they had not a single one of their retailers that would carry their entire range across men's, women's, kids, the whole nine yards. And so they had to establish a D2C play to have full range representation in market. The second thing was, is that at the end of a season, they had to have a liquidation channel because their B2B customers were not prepared to take the risk of buying a whole bunch of end of season inventory and having to try to liquidate that at a cut rate price. Why should they have no incentive to do that? So they needed to have a direct to consumer channel where they could liquidate end of season stock and not massively undercut the market, just sell it at enough of a discount to, to move the stock through and be able to move into the next season. So they had to establish a DDC play. But what's interesting about this is that within 12 months of them establishing their DDC channel, and it was purely online, it was a pure play online e-commerce e direct to consumer channel, and they did not discount online their current season inventory. They didn't, they sold it at MSRP. So they, they sold it the retail price. They would occasionally do specific promotions with coupon codes or whatever, but their website price, they didn't undercut their retailers, but they got such pushback and they could not get track enough to make up for all of the brands that threatened to pull their dealership. And it was, and it accounted for tens of, it was, I think it was yeah, something yeah. like a hundred million dollars or something like that a year of revenue that was threatened to be pulled from them. And so what they did is they turned their website into a pure online catalog and they stopped being transactional online because otherwise they would have lost all their wholesale business. So I totally understand where you're coming from. And it is absolutely a challenge. But I think if you speak with your retailers about that, and there are ways around this, it's not just a matter of making sure that you've got full product and range representation in market at all times. But you can also, you can also do some structural things with your e-commerce website to where they maybe get a little bit of credit. So you can divide your area into catchments in your specific area. So if you have an existing B2B retailer in a given region, you might assign them a catchment and you might say, okay, 
of all the online sales we do, we're going to give you a little bit of a cut and we're just going to give you that as like a commission because you're representing our brand in your area, right? So there, there's a few different ways like that, that you can set this up. You could even get your online customers to pick their local regional therapist, skincare therapist, whoever it is that might retail the products, you could get them to select as part of the checkout process, the one that's closest to them so that you capture that as the one that should get the credit. How do, Or you could even put something online about in as part of the checkout process, you'd have to be on plus to do this, or you'd have to do some funky hacking to get this through, but definitely do it. You could ask them how they heard about you. And then you could make that a free form text field that you could then parse. And if they told you a specific local retailer or skincare specialist, then you could give that customer to them and assign that to them with a custom customer tag. And then that allows you to run analytics very easily based on customer tag. So you could simply tag every single customer in your Shopify database with the catchment area of the person that belongs to. And then all the revenue, you could give a tiny commission to those local shops. And so there are a few different ways other than that to deal with this pushback, but I have seen it before and it is a challenge, but oftentimes it just comes down to biting the bullet and saying, we have customers that want to buy direct from us. We have customers that want to buy direct online from us. We have customers that want to buy our entire range. And none of our retailers are able to do this. They're never, they're, they're, they're not able to offer the complete online offering that we are able to offer. We have no choice. Our customers have a gun to our head. They want a direct consumer experience engaging directly with us. Maybe you ask them the question. Maybe you say, what do you want us to do? We want to be a sustainable business. We want to be able to make good products. We want to be able to make a profit and be sustainable long-term. What do you suggest we do? Because we're getting pressure from customers to buy from us direct in some instances, and we need to be able to furnish that market. We need to be able to supply that market. So what is your suggestion? What would you like us to do? And open a dialogue on that footing. Put the ball back in their court. Good idea. Okay. And then on the back of that, what does it really take to build a subscription offering? Yeah, on Shopify, it's tough because there are not any fantastic subscription. I mean, there, there are a few, there are a few, there's Recharge and there's a few others. The problem is that most of the apps out there, because of the way that Shopify locks down its checkout, there's they've opened up their checkout SDK relatively recently. So I expect this to change. It was only happened about six months ago. And there are certain subscription apps out there that are rewriting. And I'll give you one off the top of my head, Bold Subscriptions, for example. They're in the process of rewriting their subscriptions app to take advantage of the checkout SDK and the openness of that checkout SDK. Because there was a lot of hacks that went on pre-checkout SDK to be able to get that into a place where they could do almost like a much more native subscription model inside Shopify. Cause effectively they had to split out the orders. They had to actually split out the products as well. They had to have effectively be redirected for their own checkout of the subscription products. And then they would do the rebilling through, through bold and then effectively recreate those orders in Shopify. Once the subscription triggered and they needed to place an order, they'd actually be placing an order on behalf of the customer and then injecting that order via API back into Shopify so that it was lodged against that customer. So it, and they would do the billing effectively. It's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. There's not a lot of super seamless solutions yet, but bold, bold subscriptions is probably going to get you about as close as you're going to get because you need to be able to have pause, resume, skip, uh, amalgamate subscriptions across multiple products and a across multiple frequencies. You need to be able to drop items off of a renewal. There's a trem- I've done a lot of work with subscriptions over the years, and it is a tremendously complex user experience to build for and you know, to cater for all the different use cases where somebody comes to your website and buys something new, but they want to add it to an existing subscription, for example. There's lots and lots of use cases like that are hyper complex. So you really need a subscriptions platform that is thought of all those weird and wonderful use cases to make it completely seamless for the customer. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you. No worries. We'll turn the, we'll turn the mic over to anybody else that wants to ask a question. Shelly, anything else, anything else from you? Because I think uh, you probably had the longest list of questions coming into this particular session. Yeah, over the weekend, Jason had mentioned about that WhatsApp catalog for the B, B2B side of the business and that, that payment. I think somebody has come back to me and said, oh, I'm willing to talk to you, so I will reach out to them. But yeah, just that piece, because it doesn't give the total after that. After you'd mentioned that, I googled a bit and I can see you can do it with Google Forms, etc. But how do you 
do that payment piece. Yeah. So there's a really cool, it sounds like you're pretty familiar with bold already. So there's a few different ways you can do this. And one of those ways is through bold checkout. Now, bold checkout effectively gives you a hosted checkout page with totals and everything. It's basically like a, it's like a one click checkout basically. And that link can be pasted anywhere. And so you can have a fully populated cart. You can have you, even as an admin, if you're talking to someone over, you know, let's say it's WhatsApp or let's say it's Facebook messenger or whatever, you can send them a link with the specific payment for that specific order. And then what happens is bold checkout will actually sync that order to Shopify. So it actually creates the order in Shopify with all the customer's details. There's also a few different payments platforms that can facilitate this almost anywhere. So there's there's reach payments, there's balance payments, there's a couple of other payments platforms. Even to a lesser degree, Stripe can facilitate these in-platform payments in unique ways with unique payment links. So I would, I but I would start looking very seriously at bold checkout as a very full feature. And look, I don't work for bold. I don't get a, I don't get a commission for recommending them. They're just really smart guys. And they've built some really good platform technologies over the years that are e-commerce platform agnostic. They started out really just writing apps for Shopify. That was always the genesis of their business. But now with their bold promotions, their bold checkout, their bold subscriptions, they now have this standalone suite of apps that are not dependent on an e-commerce platform to function. So instead of being a, an app plugin, they're standalone functionality. So I would look at the bold checkout because I think you could do almost anything you want to do using bold checkout. Okay. And that will calculate from WhatsApp though? It can. It would probably require a little bit of custom integration between WhatsApp and bold checkout, but they could definitely give you some advice on how to do that. Great. Thank you. There's also some, there's also some text SMS commerce platforms that don't just do commerce via SMS. They also do commerce via WhatsApp. So you can actually send out offers via their platform, an SMS number via WhatsApp. And effectively people have subscribed to get deals and promotions and they effectively one click purchase and they just say yes and it executes the transaction. So I would look at in, in the UK, I don't know. There's a few down here that operate locally in ANZ that specialize in SMS commerce or message-based commerce. But I'm sure that in the UK, you'll have some local specialized companies that do the same. So I would be looking at companies that specialize in SMS or message-based commerce, because if they do SMS-based commerce, most likely they also have an integration with the major messaging platforms, most likely. Okay, great. Thank you. Good stuff. Before um, we move on, Shelly, before we move on to, to Maud and John, just one second. Sorry to interrupt you, John. The other thing I thought of based on your last comment, Shelly, around the challenges of balancing D2C with B2B, the other thing that I've seen can be very successful is to create two different ranges. So in your case, it'd be like a practitioner only range. And then you have a like a consumer range or like a prosumer range. Yeah, I've yeah. seen that work really well as well. So you basically do a range extension and you say, okay, I'm going to have certain products that I only sell B2B. I'm going to have certain products that I only sell D2C and never the twain shall meet. And they could be very similar products, by the way. You might just have different price points. And there's some other ways you can differentiate products other than just the pure formulaic differences between them. But that's another thing that I've seen work very well is to have practitioner exclusive ranges as well. Yeah, I think the challenge with that is <clears throat> the volume that comes through the professional trade. They're not typical retailers. It's slow. It just wouldn't warrant. It just wouldn't warrant yes. that. And it's trying, it's not our job to teach them to sell. We can handhold as much, but it takes up a terrible lot of time to, to do that. But yeah, I don't think it's going to go away. The, the, sorry, the other thing you could also look at doing is being able to take bookings through your website on behalf of them to where you create a booking engine and you became, you become almost like a nexus for directing traffic to them in store because you're the nexus of the brand. So you could add a practitioner finder. I actually didn't look at your website before this call, but I don't know if you have a, like a practitioner do finder. You have, do you have a stalkers finder actually? Yeah. Yeah. So what you might be able to do is to weave that more as opposed to just simply have it as a standalone function. You could mm -hmm. weave that into the process. And then you could also introduce like a Jebit 
piece of functionality. So Jebit is a quiz commerce plugin and app that, that plugs into Shopify, it plugs into other platforms too, but it plugs specifically into Shopify where you can, you basically ask a bunch of questions and you spit out a bunch of product recommendations. You yeah, might as part that. of that process, then be able to recommend a, a local practitioner that can help them based on that process. So there's probably ways in which you can help drive more foot traffic for those shops, which then puts you into their good graces. Yeah, actually weave them into that. The other idea that we had a few years back was, again, they sometimes don't have the money to stock the full range or don't want to carry everything. Is there a way that we can weave them in to if they don't have stock that they purchase online and we give them a kickback and we deliver to the customer? Yep, dropship model. Works perfect, works really well. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to, I just, those two things just hit my mind just as you were introducing yourself. So I thought I'd just throw those out there just before I forgot them. John, did you have any questions? So one 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 thing that, that struck to me even while Shari was talking to me was what channels do we go to say for, so it's like we had this conversation last time that SaaS products like ours don't have a lot of differentiating factors Say, so so anybody in say search spring, Nosto, Algolia, all of them mostly look the same, just the external cover looks different. So when you don't have a lot of differentiating factors, how do you stand out? How do you, or what channel do you go to or how do you get attention of people? I'll tell you what's interesting is, and we discussed this last time is I don't see any, well, many of the big brands doing a lot, frankly, from a content perspective. I just don't see a tremendous amount of content being put out there that is educational, that is entertaining, that is fun, is engaging, that isn't trying to sell. I don't see a lot of that put out there. And what I do see being very effective that will usually stop me mid scroll is if there is a 10 second clip of doing a specific function in a piece of software in admin, then I'll usually, it will usually stop me scrolling. If it's actually showing a function, almost like a loom video, and it's, it's 10 seconds or less, if it's showing a really specific function, okay, here's how you drag and drop for like, in your case, let's say I'm trying to merchandise within a category and I'm trying to merchandise for a specific keyword, right? If I could see the Ajax dra drag and drop functionality of being able to reorder the standard results on a category page, and then I click save, and then I go to front end. So maybe I do the front end, maybe I do a quick cut to the front end for a normal query and I see the results. Then I go to the back end, I do a quick reorder of the merchandising, I click save, I go to the front end, I rerun the query again, and then I see the reordered results. I think if you can show hyper practical examples of the usability of your platform for merchants in little snippets that are really feature specific, then that will oftentimes stop. You don't even have to have any, you don't even have to necessarily have an overlay of words of what you're saying. You don't even necessarily have to say anything in the post itself. When you put the post, say, for example, on LinkedIn, you could just simply in the text, you say, here's an example of our drag and drop merch capability within categories. And you just, you have the video there. That's it. It could be a 10, 15 second video. That's it. And it's enough to stop the scroll because it's a, it's different enough that you have to do a pattern interrupt, the scroll pattern. You just, you have to interrupt the scroll pattern and anything you can do to think about new ways to interrupt that pattern in creative ways. I think that's an important part of it. But I also think being in places that you think your customers are not. I think a lot of B2B brands, they think their customers aren't on TikTok. They think their customers aren't on Instagram. They think their customers aren't necessarily on Facebook. They think their customers aren't in places that they absolutely are. They There's plenty of e-commerce marketers that live on TikTok, right? Whether it's because to be entertained or because they want to learn how to market on TikTok, whatever. And so they're going to be exposed to your content potentially. And so I think that you have to be creative if you don't want to just do spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on performance marketing, bottom of the, bottom of the funnel stuff. If you want to genuinely create demand for your category or your product, then you're going to have to do a little bit of guerrilla marketing to get you there. I think you're going to have to either start a podcast or you're going to have to, you're going to have to join some online groups that specialize in visual merchandising. You have to get in there. You're going to have to provide advice. You're going to have to provide support. You're going to have to do things like, I mean, think about what I'm doing here, right? So I'm doing mentoring, right? I'm doing mentoring because I want to see our industry get better. I want to see our industry improve. I want to share what I've learned over 20 plus years, and I want to send the letter back down. 
But by definition, just by sharing this content online, it helps to establish me as a thought leader. It helps establish my credibility. It helps to establish me as hopefully a person that can be trusted and that resonates with other people. And my content in weird and wonderful ways makes it into places that I can never anticipate. I get people reaching out to me on LinkedIn saying, hey, I'd like to tee up a call. looks like you might be able to help me. And I don't know what piece of content they've seen until I talk to them that maybe caused them to think about reaching out to me. I do no paid marketing for my consulting business. And it's all based on me trying to give as much help to the industry as I can. But by definition, it keeps me in people's faces. So I think B2B brands need to think long and hard about engaging with their audience. And if you look at somebody like Chris Walker, not only is he teaching SaaS platforms and brands like you how to market in 2022, but he's also building his business online in exact, he's building in public. He's putting out content in public. He's putting out his content, his podcast in public. He's built his entire company. They're doing $20 million a year in business. That was built on the back of his personal brand on LinkedIn. So Look, it can be done and you don't have to spend a whole lot of money on performance marketing to do it. But I think you got to be a little bit gorilla and you have to have long term commitment to it. So that's my only that's my only bit of advice, John. I think there's no silver bullet is basically what I'm saying. Yeah, that makes sense. So with me, like I am willing to help people help the market understand the benefits of an e-commerce consultant even if I'm not the one a customer selects. So I want to open that dialogue up. I want to open up the dialogue around the benefits of agencies, consultants, marketers. I want to educate the market very broad and hopefully people will get the benefit out of that. Some of the people that will get benefit out of that might be potential customers, but that's not what I'm That's not my goal. My goal is to help the industry as a whole get better and grow because if it's a bigger pie, and even if I get the same percentage of the pie, if the pie is bigger overall because I've been able to help grow the pie, then that by definition means my business can grow too. Yeah, I get it. That makes sense. That that definitely makes sense. What, What metrics do you track? So what kind of evaluation do you do at the end of three months or at the end of six months to say, hey, all the efforts to create demand has already has given benefits to us or has resulted in so much metrics. To well, try. I would say that it's almost exclusively qualitative for me. If I can see that the numbers of weekly listeners to the podcast is growing and interest in the podcast is growing, then that's a win. If the amount of people that follow me on LinkedIn, some people call following a vanity metric. I don't. I look at it as a signal. I look at it as a signal that I'm creating content that resonates enough for people to want to follow me and to want to consume more of my content. More people reaching out to me for connection. More people DMing me and telling me, thank you for putting out this content. I'm learning a lot from it. I get probably somewhere between five and 10 DMs a week. People just telling me, hey, I, re- I recently connected with you. I just want to tell you, I'm learning so much from your content. Thank you for putting it out. So it's most, what is the interaction with my posts? Am I getting a lot of comments? Am I getting a lot of reactions to the post? Um, am I getting a lot of interaction? between people in the post themselves in the comments? Are they interacting with each other? And are they interacting with me? And are they interacting with the content? That is almost exclusively, it's quant and qual, right? So you could load up Shield analytics for LinkedIn and you could see the trend over time in terms of the reactions, in terms of the likes, in terms of the follows connections. You can track all that, but read doesn't, you don't need to look at analytics to know whether your content is resonating and whether it's making an impact. And so for me, making an impact i don't i'm not expecting to draw a straight line between content impact and revenue i have no expectation of that and that's the problem today it's you have to trust the process you have to trust that good things happen when you do things with the right intent my intent is to educate my intent is to entertain and I know that good things come out of that. New partnerships, new friendships, new industry connections, potentially new business. But there's lots of good potential things that come out of content other than just pure conversion-based revenue metrics that you expect people to convert in 30, 60, 90 days. That's not enterprise software. The sales cycles for enterprise software can be 12 months very easily. And so you you, you have to play the long game and just... Very few brands are prepared to play the long game when it comes to content, in my experience. And it's 
difficult. So when you don't know things on your own, it's difficult to convince a CEO or it's difficult to convince a management that you have to go the content route. In the long run, this will give you fruits, but it's it. What can you do immediately? How can you show them that there's some sort of attraction immediately? So I'm, yeah, so coming from there as well. I guess like Chris Walker says, Chris Walker is better at saying this than uh, I'll ever be because this is his forte. This is his game. But I think what he'd say is, let's look at what we're doing today. And is it working? If going to trade shows, is that working? Is it generating demand or is it just generating leads that go into a bowl for a draw to win something free, to win a free iPad? Are people just putting their name in the bowl to get the free iPad or are they genuinely interested in our technology? What are we doing today from a marketing perspective and is it working? Is it actually leading to genuine demand that is converting at a high rate from the point of initial contact to the point of signing on the dotted line, regardless of the time it takes, is it ultimately converting at a high rate? And if not, then you're not losing anything by reallocating that budget to more long-term thinking, to more long-term demand generation-based marketing. And so you've got to look at what you're doing today and you have to work backwards from that and say, is it working? And if it's working, then do more of that. If it's not working, then you're not losing anything by doing something different. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you. If you'd like to register for free for the mentor sessions with Jason Greenwood, Head over to greenwoodconsulting.net, scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, and click Get Mentored by Jason. See you there.